Dweliek Seed Bulk, Dlewi Challenge Audrey, Dlewisi Challenge Audrey, Dlewi Gespuwek, Achwigi Ulsitguk. So this is Bay River First Nation. And uh, I've been an ecologist for about uh, eight years. Before that, I went to university for ecology. But also, I love to learn about the land from the elders and other people who live and work off the land, uh, even if they're not called elders. They have a lot of knowledge that they've shared with me. And so just like Elder uh, Albert Marshall talks about two-eyed seeing, I hope that that's kind of the way that I do my work, is that I, uh, I look at things from different perspectives and I try to learn from mainstream science and Mi'kmaq science. And so what I wanted to do uh, with you today for Earth Day was to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do here, just as some uh, some inspiration so that you know what kinds of stuff I've been doing. But then I want to talk with you guys about what do you do in your school or in a club that you have or at home for the earth. And uh, so first thing is, could I just understand uh, which communities or schools I'm talking with? Either Faye, could you help me figure out these four? Uh, yep, just one second. So on the uh, top left, we have Elsa Bukduk School. And on the right, we have Eskino Bedic School. And on the bottom uh, left, we have Member 2 School and Eskazoni Elementary in the right corner, bottom right. All right, excellent. All right, so what I'm going to do first is show you some slides and pictures uh, about some of the things that, uh, that I've been working on. So I'm just going to move the camera, but I'm right here, okay? There we go. This is the way we figured out last time that'll work, that you can see the slides. All right, so just quickly, uh, we all know that we have this direct relationship to the earth. So we, for example, we eat from the earth, we go to the bathroom, and then it gets composted, and it goes back into the earth, and we eat from the earth, and it cycles around. So that's very, very basic. So we know that, for example, if we put toxins in our bodies, or depending on what we're eating, say that we're eating a food that has a lot of uh, pesticides, for example, then they could go through and still end up on the land and find a way to contaminate the land. They're even finding out that uh, some of our medications that we're taking actually are finding its way into the water system through our sewage and they're not really sure how to take uh, all of those out. So what we put in our bodies actually ends up on the earth no matter if you think that it's just going through uh, a septic system, it's still coming out uh, on the earth. But then also, when you really think about it, uh, if there's something that's toxic going on the land, it's going to end up in us. So that's why when we do our traditional hunting and fishing, we want to make sure that those animals and the fish and the plants are free of contaminants. And in this day and age, there's more and more and more contaminants uh, in the land and water around us. And so it's becoming a bigger and bigger concern so that our health centers are working on things like that. They're testing and they're looking at studies showing, well, how, how polluted are our waters and our plants and animals. And so it's something that we really have to think about. So when we think that we're learning really great things from the elders about going on the land to go pick medicines or to go get berries, and then we do that, now for the some of the first time in many, many generations, we actually have to stop and look at that plant and say, well, how much toxins does this have in it? Is this going to be better or worse for me if I take it? And that's a really horrible thought for us because it's, uh, it's now interrupting uh, who we want to be as Mi'kmaq. So just to give you a little bit of, of an idea here, uh, ecologists talk about a human footprint. Footprint not just like literally under your foot, but all the impact that we have on the land. 
as humans, no matter if you're Mi'kmaq or not, but all of us, all humans. And so some of them got together for the Wildlife Conservation Society and they compiled tons and tons and tons of research over a number of years and they came up with this map. So they made this map where uh, the most green on here would be the most natural that the land is at, where the animals and the plants are healthy, they're undisturbed. You can go walk through the woods, uh, but really that it doesn't have a lot of uh, human disturbance. So it's a little bit bright, it's hard to see, but there's little bits of green around here in Maine. There's little bits of green in the Gas Bay. There's little bits of green in New Brunswick. There's little bits of green through Nova Scotia, mostly around here, which includes the Tobiatic and Kejimakujik, uh Park. And just so that you see, this is where I am. This is Ulsutkuk. This is Bear River First Station, not, so not too far from the National Park. And so up in the highlands, and, uh, and probably there's, there's other parks here that are uh, including in that green, but there's just little bits of green, of area that don't, that doesn't have too much human uh, impact, human footprint, that we haven't builded too many buildings and roadways and, and things like that. But then the yellow parts are where there's a little bit of human, uh, human pressure there, and orange is where there's more, and red is where there's so much human footprint that really it's not a natural state, it's not a natural forest, it's not a natural swamp, it's not a natural area. And that really we're, these are areas where we're putting a lot of uh, pressure on wildlife. So if you just kind of um, look at this for a moment. So this is all of Mi'kma'ki and Maliseet territory and all of our neighbors. And so this is all where, where you guys are, uh, all of your communities. and so. I mean, PEI, it's just changed so much. And so, so much of New Brunswick, so a lot of where you see the red is where there's a lot of towns and cities. So in Nova Scotia, so where I'm mostly used to, all of this here, this is where there's a major highway and lots of towns and towns, and this is where humans have settled. And so around Halifax, obviously, and, and Truro, so up there, and, and, uh, even our ancestors would have used a lot of those shoreline areas and then where became the European settlements were probably a lot of places where our ancestors were, just that now they're so highly humanly developed and changed, it's no longer natural places. And so these are the places where it's really hard for some of the wildlife, some of the animals and some of the plants to continue on. There are some animals and plants that love human territory. And if you think of some, you think of like pigeons and crows and raccoons. So those kinds of animals, and there's some plants that are doing very, very, very well. But there's a lot of other plants and animals that actually are having a really hard time sharing territory with us because we're so bossy. And that's where I started some of my work. So down here in Gespelwick, we have one of the highest concentrations of species at risk in Canada, one of the highest. And so two examples are this is the Blanding's turtle. So it's got a smooth uh, shell and it has some yellow underneath its neck. And this is the eastern ribbon snake over here. And so it has these three yellow yellow parallel lines down its back. And so this is threatened and this is endangered. Endangered means that if we don't do something to help them now, they could become extinct. Threatened means that if we don't do something now, they might become endangered. Some other, uh, some other examples of species that we're working with is that we've been looking for some special rare plants. So some of them are threatened, some of them are endangered. And so this is me and this is Sarah Jeremy from Wildcat, Acadia First Nation. So we, uh, with the help of some other botanists, we found some plants that we were looking for. And so when we find them, we try to protect them, we take note of them, we watch them from one year to the next. With the reptiles that I just talked about, so we look out for them, we can protect their eggs. If we notice some of the Blanding's turtle, turtles laying eggs, then we can protect them, put a, a cover over it to make sure that people don't run over it, raccoons aren't um, 
going and, and getting their eggs, but also just that if we find an area that has a lot of these reptiles or these plants, that we say, okay, you know what? This is their territory. It's not human territory. This is where we're going to let these animals and plants veto us, where they're going to say, well, you know, the, the, these are some of their territory where they need to persist, they need to live, and so maybe we can build that road somewhere else. Maybe we can build that cabin somewhere else. So just looking out for these. And another animal that's having a really hard time is a, a bird called the chimney swift. And the chimney swift in the last few years, we've noticed, have, um, have really declined. And one of the reasons is that they don't have any habitat anymore. So they, a long time ago, would roost in a big old hollow tree. And we don't have very many big old hollow trees anymore because our old growth, we've lost most of our old growth in Nova Scotia. And, and that's another ecological issue. And so where uh, birders have found some roosts around here are in some old chimneys. Now that's the other thing is that in modern day we're actually not using our chimneys and instead to be more efficient for the house we'd rather put like a, uh, a metal liner in it and cap it just to make sure that we don't lose too much heat from our house and just to be more efficient. But then it means that these chimney swifts don't have the the brick chimneys that they do like as a secondary thing. If they don't have the big old trees, uh, they would like those brick chimneys, but now we have less and less brick chimneys. And so they're having a hard time. But in Bear River, actually, we have a roost of about 140. And so we like to go down to Bear River and watch them every night. What they do is that they, um, so this is a picture over here. I'm not sure if you can see it that well, but these are my two daughters. They're looking for chimney swifts with me. And so we've sat down outside one of the houses where there is an old chimney where they have been roosting. And so what they do is that um, around, around dusk, at the end of the day in the summertime, you kind of watch these birds just flying and flying around and they're eating mosquitoes at that time of day and they start clacking to each other clack 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 and then they start to become more and more and more until it's all of them it's kind of like they're saying hey time for bed time for bed i don't want to go to bed yet and they're eating a little bit more mosquitoes but by the time that they get all of them together Somehow one of them decides it's time to go to bed. And so as soon as one goes in the chimney, then the rest. And they go, <laughs> and they all go in. Within a matter of uh, five, ten minutes, they're all in the chimney. And then the reverse happens that first thing in the morning is that they all kind of come out of the chimney at the same time. And for the chimney swifts, um, they just eat mosquitoes. So that's a good thing. We want them around. But, um, but, Herbicides and pesticides are another problem for them because the more animals who are eating um, some insects who have been poisoned, then it kind of goes through the food chain and then poisons them. And that's something else we have to think about. Are there other ways to, uh, to protect ourselves from mosquitoes than spraying uh, toxins? I don't know how many of you heard about the bats last year. Just a raise of hands. Did anybody uh, hear about the bats going endangered last year? I see one hand, one person, two people, three people, four people. All right. <laughs> so in Nova Scotia, we have six different kinds of bats. Three of them for the winter time, they go down to Florida. But there's three other bats in Nova Scotia who overwinter here, that they find a cave, they find uh, a little uh, bat house, and that they spend the winter there. It's kind of like a hibernation. So they go into this state for the whole winter, but what has happened is that there was a, a fungus from Europe that ended up over in uh, New York and it kind of traveled its way slowly and made its way to Nova Scotia and this fungus actually in the caves and in the damp dark areas where they're hibernating this fungus just slowly grows on them and it grows around their mouths and their nose and on their wings so that it bothers them so much that they wake up in the middle of the winter and they fly out of their cave and because it's the middle of the winter and they're not used to finding, having to find food in the middle of the winter, they die. So actually in the matter of just the last few years, 
We have lost over 95% of our bats, and that was as of last year. And so they did an emergency listing, and they listed the, um, the, those three bats as endangered in Nova Scotia. And that was quite serious. They did that really, really quickly because they were really concerned. And we're not sure this year, because now is when the ones surviving would be uh, waking up and starting to fly around in the springtime. So we're not really sure what the population is right now. So hopefully uh, we still have enough bats. So there we go. So the three kinds are the little myotis bat, northern myotis bat, and the tricolored bats. So something that you can do for bats is that if there, if there's this fungus in some of the caves and it's killing thousands and thousands of bats there, just put up a bat house somewhere around your house so that if there is a bat around who has survived, then you want to make sure that it has a home. Maybe not to go back to the cave, but it has a home. So I know there's a lot of people who are, are used to thinking about bats as pests, but that's something that we have to um, kind of just change the way that, that we think about some of these wildlife. Another thing that we do in our community is that we've been measuring our trees. So we can see how, uh, how quickly they're growing and dying. And so this is just an example. We've measured over 500 of our trees. And, um, and so these are some of the, the sizes of them. And the light color was the first year. The darker color, which would be really hard to see, is um, how much that they've grown. So generally, they've been growing. Um, so if, um, if we had a tree, if we measured it about this big, then about seven years later, it's about this big. So we've been measuring that. And we've also then got to see all these drops down here is when there was a tree that fell over and decayed. And that's good. We want to make sure that we have some old trees that have fallen down because then it's, it's a habitat for other little critter, critters and it's decomposing into the earth. So around your yard, if some people say, oh, we'll pick up all that dead stuff, you want to make sure that there's some dead stuff on the ground so that it can feed other, other critters. And just one last thing to tell you about is that also we've been monitoring pH of our water to make sure that it's not too acidic, not too alkaline for the fish. And that's another thing that we've been noticing is that uh, we have, and I'm not sure what it's like around the rivers where you guys live, but that um, our waters are changing, that there's a lot of different things in our water, and so actually our fish populations um, are having a really hard time. For example, you know, we don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of salmon. So that's something that a lot of communities are, are up to, is monitoring the water. So for us in, in our environmental projects, we like to make sure that we take time to talk to the elders. Talk to the people who know about the land and ask them, well, what was the land like when you grew up? And, uh, and what do we have more of and less of and what can we do? But just make sure that we're talking to the people who know about the land because you never know when you're going to miss the fact that you didn't learn that from them. So just make sure you keep up those conversations and that you go for walks with the elders and the medicine people. And, um, and ask them, well, what, what can we do for the earth? And, uh, and just keep learning and talking with them. And so I really like to do projects with the youth in our community. And, uh, and that's why I was really happy to, to do this video conference with you guys, is to hear what you're up to and, and, um, and see what you're thinking. And um, so those are some of the things that I wanted to share with you. And if I just move the camera, I just want to be able to talk with you guys now about what kinds of things that you think that a school or at home that you can do for the earth. So I'm not sure if you guys can turn on your microphones now. I don't know if there's anybody. Yeah. So turn on your microphones. Think about what it is that you can do for the earth. And so today, for example, in Bear River, we did our garbage cleanup to make sure that that garbage gets picked up. You might think that it's a little thing, but we hear more and more about all the garbage that ends up in the middle of the ocean. And it's killing wildlife in the ocean, but also it's just collecting and collecting and collecting so that we have these islands, floating islands of garbage in the middle of the ocean. 
because wherever we are, wherever the land is, we're actually not that far from the ocean. And so a little bit of litter on the side of the road sometimes flies in the air or gets carried and somehow ends up down the river and out the ocean. And so we're contributing too. And it really, really is hard on my heart when I think about um, how much work our ancestors did to make sure that we had a healthy earth and healthy people and that now uh, we want to make sure that we're not part of the problem. We want to make sure that we're not um, not hurting the earth more than what we can do to, uh, to help it. So just picking up garbage is one thing. Is there anything that you guys are, are doing as projects? Yep, stand up. Well, say your name and where we're from. Hello, um, my name is Karen. And I'm from Elsa Book School, First Nation. And our class are doing a seven project. It's grade seven A, grade seven B, are doing um a butterfly project for the painted lady butterflies. Yeah, we're gonna be hatching them and monitoring how they grow in their lifespan. Great. So for that butterfly and the salmon, the butterfly and the salmon, is that what you were saying? Yes. Great. So those are two. Is it? And so why are you uh, why are you doing that for those those two species? Sorry. Uh, she's nervous. No, that's okay. Uh, we're <laughs> talking about the other species because they're probably having a hard time. So we just, you, it sounds like you want to give them a little bit boost for their population, right? Because they've been probably having such a hard time and their population has been going low and you're worried about them. And so you, you just want to do some things to help, pop, help their population grow a little bit. That sounds excellent. I like that project. Thank you. Anybody else? Or how about then some ideas? What else do you think? And, and hopefully some of your teachers are around. So does anybody have an idea about something that they'd like to, to do for in your class or your school that you can help out around the uh, help the earth around you? Well, what else do we do at our school? We do the garden project where all of our classes plant seeds and we have a community garden out behind our school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. So that's that's some great projects from Els Book Duck. So is that all those projects are done by the grade sevens? No. Nope. Um Yes and no. Like everybody in our school takes part. The salmon project and the uh, butterfly project are a collaboration with the grade two classes. So okay. the grade twos have them in their classroom, and then the grade sevens actually help them with the more tech oriented stuff. Don't we even grab recyclables and stuff? Oh, you can mention that. Our class does the recycling in the school, yes. <laughs> Garbage, garbage bags. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, well, I've learned about our recycling system here in the Annapolis Valley, and so it would be really neat to see if how much you've learned about where your recycling goes. So every year, there's a little bit more in the Annapolis Valley that's recyclable. So there's more and more plastics every year because it depends on where our, our waste company can find where to send that. And so every year there's somebody out saying, oh, well, we'll take those plastics and turn something um, and, and make something out of it. And so it's really interesting. So it's really, really uh, important to make sure that you know how much is recyclable because you want to send as much stuff uh, to the recycling depot instead of the landfill. And some people say that um, that they, they don't worry really too much about recycling and stuff. But I tell you, in 2014, because there's more and more garbage, and the more garbage that's in our landfill, then the more of the sludge that comes out that needs to also go somewhere. And eventually, we're just going to have so many uh, places where we're just storing toxic waste. So the more batteries we have, the more cans of 
cans where there was paint and aerosol cans. There's just all these kinds of things. And so you want to make sure that even before you put something in the you buy something and you think, oh, well, this plastic is recyclable, that's okay. The first thing you should be doing is just reducing what you think you need to buy. A lot of times, we don't really need as much stuff as we think that we need. And uh, that's what I tell my, my daughters when they're asking for lots of things. I think, well, let's think about that. Do we really need a new this or a new that? And I try to make sure that I'm listening to my own advice. And. Um, and so that's that's one of the first R's is actually just to reduce that you don't always need to buy things. So, for example, uh, when we do our cleanup, I don't know about you guys in your community, but there's a lot of Tim Hortons cups out on the road. And so what I do is that I take my mug with me in the car when I know that I'm traveling or going into town so I have a, um, like a travel mug with me and I hardly ever have to ask for one of those cups and unfortunately uh, Tim Hortons cups actually has a layer of chemical in the middle of the paper and it doesn't go it doesn't uh, it's not recyclable and it doesn't go back to the earth it's not compostable so just make sure that you guys are thinking all the time we have an environment project Oh, great. Tell me about that. What? Can you tell me about your environment project? We uh, build uh, we build bird houses for the barn swallows that live right down the shore. Oh, barn swallows. Nice. So where did you, uh, where did you put them? Did you put up the bird houses yet? Not yet. Or might put them up at the end of the year. Yes, at the, so for June, to make sure that they have some extra habitats. That's excellent. Yeah. Recycle. <laughs> we painted them too. <laughs> With non-toxic paint, I hope. Yeah, yes. non-toxic paint. Okay. <laughs> So when you guys do these projects, do you sometimes, for example, do you go bird watching to learn more about the bird, the, the swallows? Do you go watch them? Uh, I don't know. Say we're going to put it up in summertime. We're putting it up in summertime. No? Are we already that? Well, not entirely sure if we clean them, but... Uh. <laughs> well, that's another thought, is just to make sure that we keep learning more about the plants and animals around us. And so something else you guys can do for the um, for summer is just get like a little booklet about how to identify birds or plants. Uh, so the best way is to go with someone who knows, but if you're just not sure or if you can't get out with them quite yet, you can go buy a guidebook or a little pamphlet and just go watch the birds, watch them a little bit more. It's amazing how much we can learn about ourselves by watching other animals and wildlife and just being out in nature. So that's one thing I would suggest is I love the idea of making the the, uh, the bird houses. So maybe go, go watch them a, a little bit since you know where they are. Any other projects? A community garden too. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, do you get to eat those vegetables? Yeah, they use it. We use it for our cafeteria. Oh, excellent! And it's an organic garden. Yeah. <laughs> Forget who the class is on the bottom right, Faye. But with somebody waving there, there's you guys are in the window. <laughs> did you? Did, do you guys um, I think have that's Escazoni. Oh, okay. Hi, that's this Scazoni is Escazoni. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. We actually have another class to get to now. Okay. But okay. thank you so much and happy Earth Day. Yes, happy Earth Day. <laughs> yeah, happy Earth Day to you too. You didn't even. Yeah, I did. Oh, it's <laughs> All right. Bye. Thanks, guys. All right, so for the rest of you left, um, yeah, happy Earth Day and get out there and enjoy the fact that it's excellent.
excellent beginning spring weather and not too many flies and mosquitoes quite yet. So you have probably about a week or so. So just get out there and enjoy the land and be part of the land. And I hope to check in with you sometime soon. If you ever want to write me an email and um, ask me some questions, or maybe I could come visit and see what your project is, uh, you can get my, so the teachers can get my email from uh, from Faye. So uh, I'd love to check in with you in a couple of months and see how you're doing. So thank you everybody. Wulalioch. Wulalioch. Great presentation. Thank you.